It's <laughs> Well, hey, man, it's great to it's great to meet you. I'm looking forward to peeling back the layers of of your life and where we're at now. And to begin that process, I want to know how you survived the last three and a half years of the pandemic. How did you get through it and how did it change you? Yeah, so for for me, you know, I had been um, in my career, you know, I had done a lot of business travel. I was traveling every week and uh you know, this just kind of became a way of life, right? You you get used to it. My my wife even said, you know, your normal isn't the normal, right? Yeah. And because you're flying, you know, you know, gone two to three days a week every week, and and all of a sudden, you know, COVID hits and we're shut down, and uh, you know, it actually honestly made life a lot more simple. Uh, and I'm like going back to business travel. I know a lot of people feel that way. Yeah. So, you know, I, we, I'd started this business um, and we'd had to pivot because what we were doing, you know, a lot, everyone, you know, we were focused on honestly in selling our product through employers primarily. And they are not, we're not looking to do anything but address the needs for COVID, right? And so we actually pivoted over and we did COVID testing. Uh, some of it we did on site. Uh, some of it we supplied uh, antigen tests once those became available and uh, had to kind of pivot our business during that time. And now we've been working our way out of it. But, it, but it's uh, definitely changed my life. The pandemic did from, you know, I think it made everybody appreciate uh you know what they have and and maybe we don't have to run and and you know run to the office as much and deal with commuting traffic and yes. and uh, planes and all that and business travel as much either so it's definitely changed my life in a lot of ways so if we put you in front of a bunch of third graders at career day and one of the kids looked up and said what do you do for a living how would you answer that child and basically we i would say we test people's DNA through a simple cheek swab and we identify what medications are going to work best for you based upon your genetics, uh, your DNA. Wow. That's, that's genius. So how did this come about? You know, so my background is pharmacy. I'm a doctor of pharmacy. I've been a pharmacist since the mid nineties. So it dates me in a little bit, but I've always been focused on getting people using medications the right way and not just handing pills across the counter. I worked behind you know, the pharmacy counter for several years. I uh, saw a lot of people struggle with medications. You know, in 2010, uh, I saw this black box warning, which on the prescribing information, which a lot of people don't really pay attention to. It's more for healthcare professionals, but it's the highest level of warning that the Food and Drug Administration can put on a medication. And the warning was recommending genetic testing. And as I looked into it, this is for a drug called Plavix or Clopidogrel, is to prevent a secondary stroke uh, for some other acute coronary syndrome and other you know, heart conditions. And it recommended genetic testing because this drug is what's called a prodrug. And what that means is it comes into your body like this, and your body has to do something to it to change it into its active form, right? Yeah. So depending on your ethnicity, 12 to 42% of people can't do that. So it's like they're taking a drug that doesn't even work for them. Yeah. And they don't even know it. Wow. And there was actually, you know, 10 years later, there was a lawsuit in uh, Hawaii. Uh, it was uh, settled for like $834 million because the Pacific Islanders, which is that 42% said we're, we weren't represented well enough in the clinical trials. And so you know, they, they're the most susceptible to this drug not working. And so I saw genetic testing is not being done. I saw this is kind of the next wave of what needs to be done and where things are headed. And so because my focus has always been on getting people using drugs the right way and, and on the right drugs and not taking more drugs than they need to, uh, I kind of jumped in and said, this is the next thing I'm going to work on. So, you know, a lot of states right now are legalizing medical marijuana and CBD and things like that. Yeah. When do you think that might become something that will be legally sanctioned, whether in a pharmaceutical environment or otherwise, that could also be a part of this matrix of, you know, localizing DNA and making it the most 
medicinally beneficial to the consumer. How do you see that fitting into what we're doing? The challenge that we're having with, uh, with medicinal marijuana, CBD, and THC is that how do we dose? We, there, there's so many different formulations, and the, the, the uh, potency and the, uh, is so variable across them that it's very difficult to, to know what to recommend and how much to take. You yeah. know, and, and you know, do, we, do we say take three gummies a day? <laughs> right. You know, we, we don't, and they're all going to vary. And, and so the challenge is coming up with some sort of standardization yeah. that people can feel comfortable with. That's really, I think, what's limiting is our ability to move forward on that. And, you know, what's amazing is at the same time, uh, CBD is impacts medications that we take. And I'm actually getting ready to, to do some work to make uh, this more visible to people because I recognize that interest and that there's a lack of awareness that you know, your genetics can impact not only how you metabolize CBD and THC, but also how that impacts your response to additional medications that you may be. Yeah, that's that's the other part of it. And I guess it's all about really clinical trials. I mean, at the end of the day, it's really about, you know, once there's a large enough field of study that says this works with this or it doesn't, or I mean, I'm sure that's being developed as all of these states kind of get into a legalization zone. There, There is some of uh, that going on, but the challenge is going to be, you know, the whole, you know, I guess, capitalistic angle of that is how is a company going to make money when you have all this available on the free market that, you know, that people are you know, willing to use and able to use. And, and in some ways it, it serves them well. I, I have a, a great friend um, who creates, she's a, you know, a biologist, PhD in biology. And, and she, uh, uh, she had a son, a, ba- a baby who, started having seizures. She actually used it as an opportunity to uh, create her own medicinal THC product. And it actually treated the seizures for this infant and saved his life. Wow. Um, and she's been trying to figure out how to bring this product to market and to do it in the right way to you know, get it recognized, as you say, but to do those clinical trials and to get every, all of that in place, you know, it's a big hurdle. Yeah. And so, it's, uh, I think there's definitely medicinal value. We just have to figure out, you know, how we do it the right way. Absolutely. So let's go back in your life where you were born and raised and how this journey into pharmaceuticals and, and where you're at today. How did all of this kind of evolve and become you? Oh, wow. That's, uh, <laughs> that is, <laughs> I'm not even sure. <laughs> I grew up in a small town in Kansas of 2,200 people called Marion, Kansas, an hour northeast of Wichita, right? So I just grew up in a small town. Um, and, you know, I, I, I went to college. Uh, I did not start out in pharmacy. Uh, but honestly, at that time, um, I saw um, pe- people working in pharmacy and they really were leading good lives and happy. And I said, well, that's where I want to be. <laughs> you know, I want to have a good life or, you know, I can enjoy life and be happy and, and help others. And, and so that really led into it. And one thing led to another. And I just, you know, I kept pushing forward, kept, you know, uh, I guess maybe leaned into Wayne Gretzky's quote, go where the puck is going to be, not where it's at today. And just kept, you know, one thing led to another. I never wanted to go into business. When I was in school, I avoided every business class. Once I got out into the world with my pharmacy degree and was practicing, like, oh, maybe I'm more interested in this. And I got into entrepreneurship and starting my own company. And and uh, I never thought I'd be where I would. I, I never could have guessed I was going to end up uh, where I am today. So when you were in the third grade, what was your ultimate dream growing up? Did you have a big dream that you were going for? Oh, yeah. I want to be an astronaut for sure. Okay. Yeah, that's it. That's <laughs> yeah. the one. Space camp, everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So and now, been... now I didn't even know I lived in, you know, lived just south of Nashville and down about an hour and a half hour south of us is Huntsville, where they do all that rocket testing and I, they have space camp. I actually could have gone there. I had no idea it existed. Yeah, if I lived here. Maybe it'd be different. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So who's been a hero for you in your life? Who's been a big inspiration? Uh, who's been a big inspiration? Um, 
you know, I don't know that I've uh, really looked up to anyone as a specific hero. I've always been strong in my faith in Christianity and and faith in God and and just using that as my North Star of, of how I need to live my life. I guess if I guess if I had to pick one, I'd say Jesus. <laughs> and so so that's a um, a pretty big hero. Um, but uh, I don't I don't know outside of that if I have a specific hero that I've really looked up to. I, you know, I have a twin brother, and it's always I've always had a best friend next to me, uh, someone I could uh, talk to and have accountability with. And I think that's important in everyone's life. Um, and that's, you know, that's been a unique, you know, a part of my life. Um, so I, I just think that's probably been my, um, uh, North star and accountability, um, uh, you know, as, as I've led my life. So if you could meet anybody alive on the planet right now, somebody that's fascinating, who would it be? Who would you love to meet and talk to? Oh, um, you know, I've thought about that question and, and, uh, you know, it might be Taylor Swift. You know, I'm a big Chiefs fan. Travis Kelsey dating Taylor Swift. Not not from wanting to date her or anything, but she's right. you know, she's done a great job of just with her life and she she just seems so well grounded uh for all the success that she's had. And she's definitely had to, you know, make her, her own decisions at different times and move forward and deal with a lot of pressure. Uh, it's amazing how she leads her life and holds herself up so well. So I, I I might just say Taylor Swift right now. You know, what's fascinating is how many girls now probably want to go to Arrowhead. <laughs> and then how many are buying you know, Chiefs jerseys, Travis yeah. Kelsey jerseys. Right. <laughs> or, I mean, it, and, and half of them probably want to have a sighting. Maybe she'll walk by or they'll oh, see absolutely. her up there. You know, so it's wild. Yeah. The whole This whole phenomenon unfolding is very, very wild from a pop culture standpoint. It's It's, I mean, it's like the Chiefs were already kind of you know it's weird to feel like the chiefs or somebody that people are looking at i mean i used to go watch them at training camp at william jewel college and liberty back in the day when no one went and <laughs> you know they had bill kenny and todd blackledge and all of these draft picks that never materialize and they could never go anywhere so the fact that they're on the forefront now is weird but it almost seems like they've leaped to a hollywood level with taylor now <laughs> It's, oh yeah, it's like the, when when people talk about putting Travis Kelsey on the map, right? Isn't that yeah, funny? <laughs> like, it's so weird. I mean, he's been an All Pro. He's one of, if not these, one of the top tight ends in all of NFL history. He's pretty well known in the NFL world at least. Yeah, but uh, I, now it is at a completely different level for him. Yeah, I mean, yeah. just just the fact that everybody was dressing up for Halloween and just the whole yes. explosion—it's weird. It's yeah, really to good. your point to your point earlier, it is I'm um, really interested to see you know what happens. Uh, does he go to Argentina? Everyone's looking to see if he shows up at a concert. What happens after the NFL season? And uh it's gonna be crazy. Yeah, it certainly Just, is. So I'm curious, you know, I work in technology by day, and technology is one of those things, obviously, that moves very fast. I mean, even this advent of AI really took off quick, you know, because we've always had like the Google Home things and Siri, mm -hmm. and there's been advents of AI, but I'm curious in the pharmaceutical world, let's say 10, 15 years down the line, where do you see things developing? What is there another wave that, that is going to happen that's going to change that industry? Yeah, you know, a friend of mine uh, went to a program at Duke about three or four years ago, and the, it was on the innovation, and they said, 85% of the jobs that will exist in 2029 uh, don't exist today. I mean, 85%. Wow. So that's that's kind of crazy to think about. And when I think about, you know, my practice, when I came into pharmacy practice, pharmacists uh, did not even do immunizations. And, and 17 years later, and I was one of the pioneers in helping to get that started, you know, 17 years later, we've done over 50% of the COVID vaccinations. I actually went to my son's, one of my son's uh, L, uh, middle school uh, and days and went, did a did a talk to the students about being a pharmacist. And I asked, what do you think about when you think about being a pharmacist? And they said, well, that's where I go to get my shots. I'm like, holy cow, we've changed from, yeah. from just counting pills and handing them across the counter, which was great. Uh, and then to think of what I'm doing now with genetic testing, that didn't exist, you know, yeah. when I got started either, right? So to look at AI and think of where we can be, we already know. I mean, it 
there's was so much information that no human can keep up with all the new clinical studies, comparing them to the previous studies and really making the best decisions from them. Yeah, uh, there's actually studies that show it takes, I think the number 17 years for clinical guidelines to be inc fully incorporated into medical practice for doctors to fully utilize treatment guide. Well, obviously they're outdated, by then, but that's how long it takes for the information to get adopted. So I think with AI, our hope is that, you know, all that information can just be synthesized so much faster yeah. um, and, you know, that we can get the better treatments out and adopted much more quickly. Yeah. Um, now, the key is making sure the, the basis of that information is sound, right? I think that's where we all still have a lot of questions to know what are the influences behind the AI and, and what can be happening there. Uh, but I think it's certainly an opportunity, you know, 10 to 15 years from now, we could easily have 3D printed medications where, you know, uh, Star Trek becomes a reality, right? <laughs> where you open up the, the microwave oven, basically, and your pill is there to take. And, and it's got everything that you need to take in one pill instead of having to take multiple, multiple pills. I mean, I've seen some people and as they get older, you know, some of them people are taking 15 to 20 or more medications a day. It's like, that's their diet. Hopefully we can make advances. So, you know, we get people on the right medications and it's not so cumbersome to take. So I think there's certainly a lot of opportunities between 3D printing and AI and, and how that can all be brought together to improve how people are treated. So every day you wake up, what is your motivation? You know, what is it that makes you do the work that you do and be who you are? What is that for you? Yeah, for me, it's, you know, it's just trying to figure it out every day. There's always something like, you know, we're trying to get, uh, what we're doing is not as well known, right? We're testing people's DNA to get people on the right medication specific for them. Like who would not want that? Yeah. Um, and right. And the cost has come way down from where it was in 2010. It's a little bit understandable in that example I gave, gave earlier. Genetic testing was, you know, three or $4,000. Now it's three or $400, right? And so you have to test one time for your life. So it's really just a drive to figure out how we can do things better and how we can get this information out and get it adopted so that people just can be treated better and don't have to go through the the pain and suffering that we we hear about today i mean we hear stories every day of people who've been searching for the right answers for years right for mental health especially to find the right medication that's going to help them or find the right solution and it, it doesn't need to happen that way anymore we don't have to go through as much trial and error so really it's a drive to just uh find that spark of what's going to get people's attention and get people understanding what we have to offer and, and, and utilizing it because we think it can make such a difference in people's lives. So what, what would you consider one of your best success stories in business so far? One of my best success stories in business. Well, I mean, it would have to be getting pharmacist immunizing, right? Yeah. Because uh, that's been the most widely adopted. Uh, you know, we started that back in, in 1997, back in the late 90s. Uh, we started trying to get pharmacists to do that. We started getting pharmacists. We had to change practice acts and legal regulatory uh, environments. We, we had to get people comfortable with it and getting, um, it was a little bit easier in that case because, um, because people were used to coming to pharmacies to get flu shots. They, we had visiting nurses come in once a month in October and we had lines outside of the stores 200 deep. And so it became more convenient. Um, and then uh, over time now seeing that happen with COVID. Now the challenging part of that, and you, you may have seen some of this on the pharmacy walkouts and the stresses in that workplace is there's been a lot of other dynamics on the whole payment for medications where pharmacies haven't been able to you know, really adopt that in a way to incorporate their clinical practice. And now that's actually caused more stress on the environment. So even though we're getting more care, more widely adopted, uh, that, that 
environment has become very stressful and challenging and, and we're really coming to a tipping point in this right now where we'll see what happens over the next few months there's some definite structural changes that need to happen um, in in pricing and contracts uh, for pharmacies that uh, are we're gonna it could be a real uh, public health crisis and a lot of pharmacies are gonna have to shut down so let's say you have a dream tonight you run into a 20 year old version of you and you could give that young version of you a piece of advice based on the wisdom you've gained so far in your life. What advice would you give your younger self? And that's, you know what? I would say believe in yourself faster. Have yeah. confidence and uh, don't wait to, uh, and don't, don't limit yourself by your own self-doubt. You think, you know, I, I was kind of slow to get the courage to do some of the things I wanted to do in life. And and uh, I've persevered through things that I never, you know, I got to places that probably never thought I would get to. I was president of the American Pharmacists Association three years ago. Um, That's a pretty big deal that I had to uh, work towards. And I you know, got there, but, but, you know, I think I could have accomplished more if I would have had more confidence and belief in myself early on. So everyone out there has a perception of you, family, friends, clients, colleagues, but you run the show. <laughs> What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? You know, I think I'm someone who's always trying to make things better. Uh, I'm someone who's willing to take risks, uh, but not not uh, not high risks, right? I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go jump out of an airplane. It's not for me. But uh, but I'm, I can t I have a tolerance for risk um, and. Uh, tolerance for ambiguity and being willing to figure things out and trusting that things are going to work out. Um, so that's uh, probably the short answer. So if anyone wants to find out more about these DNA tests, learn more about you, reach out, what, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, go to uh, exactmeds.com and check it out. Uh, you can see more about that product there, you know, and, uh, yeah, if they want to reach out to me directly, I'm fine if people email me. Uh, it's B T I C E, B Tice at the company name RX Genomics with an X on the end, B Tice at rxgenomics.com. But check out the product, exactmeds.com, and, and see if it can help you or someone you love because we can make a big difference by getting people just using the medications that work specifically for them. Wonderful. Brad, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Best of luck with everything. Hey, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you, Joe. Have a great one and good luck to you as well. Yes, sir.